Mm, quite a few folks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Therapy Thursday. Today is August 25th, is in 2022, and Therapy Thursday is brought to you by the Rehab Services as well as UNC Community Engagement um, Committee. So basically what we're trying to do here is we're trying to give back to the community um, to provide education as well as rehab what rehab services can do for you. You may have heard about this through your email. You may have heard about this through social media. Uh, there is a Facebook page for UNC Therapy Services, and this is also recorded onto the YouTube channel. If you have any questions throughout, please feel free to put that in the chat function. Um, and then uh, also any of these links to the Facebook, to the YouTube channel um, are gonna be in the chat as well. All right. So just to get started, we're going to talk about long COVID and how exhausting it is. I'm Marie Curtis. I'm going to be your occupational therapist that guides you through this today. And then you're going to meet Courtney Matrunik, who is also going to be your physical therapist, who's going to do our guiding today. All right, so I mentioned my name is Marie Curtis. I'm an occupational therapist here at UNC Health. I work in the outpatient realm and I work with patients with neurological conditions. I've been here for about six and a half years. Um, before that, I did some travel therapy. I've worked in pediatrics as well. Um, and then I also have a specialty certification in low vision. I did some continuing education through the University of Alabama at Birmingham, um, where I was able to really focus on the rehab role in low vision. Um, and that's more thinking about uh, people who are not able to fix their vision through um, contacts or lenses or through surgery. Um, and then also uh, thinking about the visual processing aspect as well. Um, I'm going to let Courtney introduce herself. <laughs> and... All right, so what we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about what is long COVID. We're going to talk about a few tips and tricks and how um, to address that. We're going to talk about when to seek out services from occupational therapy and physical therapy and how to reach out for help. I couldn't hear you. All right. Um, so just to go back, so Courtney is a physical therapist at the Center for Rehabilitation Care, um, also where I work. Um, she, gosh, she's been practicing 14 years, right? 15, 14, 15 years, oh my goodness. So for 15 years, she's been working here at UNC. She specializes working with the neurological patients. Um, so does a lot with spinal cord injuries, a lot of community outreach there. Um, she's one of our founding therapists for the Long COVID Recovery Clinic, um, which I also am working with her in. Um, she's done a lot of really cool presentations on the national and state level. Uh, we did get to do one state level presentation together, so that's why we're, we're doing this again now. All right, and then are you going to be able to unmute? Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's 
You need that one. Technical difficulties with therapists, not computer sciences. So, um, at the bottom. Sorry, guys. Good. Okay. You can still hear me? Do we have thumbs up? Um, so long COVID, what is it? It's got so many different names. And if you look here underneath, got some thumbs up. If you look underneath this beautiful yellow umbrella, there's multiple terms. I think the most important ones that you should probably look for are long COVID and PASC. If you're trying to look at research, PASC stands for post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Long word, um, much better abbreviated. Uh, because of the, the multiple definition or terms, there's multiple definitions too, but um, the more condensed version you're going to find on the CDC website. And what they say is that long COVID is an umbrella term for the wide range of physical and mental health symptoms four or more weeks after a SARS-CoV-2 infection. A lot of our patients describe they have completely recovered from their virus, and then they abruptly have a resurgence of those symptoms. So you can imagine that's pretty frightening um, and anxiety provoking. There is research now that shows that the more severe your infection was, the more likely you are to have long COVID. But I can tell you from our experience, the vast majorities of our patients um, have more mild cases. It's also really important to point out here that there is not a test to determine if someone is dealing with long COVID. <clears throat> In fact, most will have a completely normal workup. Their blood tests look great. All of the imaging, MRIs, x-rays, everything looks fabulous. And these patients are getting the multi-million dollar workup. But the lack of laboratory or imaging abnormalities doesn't invalidate their experience, the severity, or the importance of their symptoms or conditions. Charge. <laughs> this is, we need heaven. <laughs> um, how common is long COVID? Again, this is going to be a number that you're going to hear many different answers to. Um, on the CDC website, their estimate is one out of every five people that have been diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 um, have uh, high, that, that's the risk factor for long COVID. Um, I believe that early on in the pandemic, it was 33%, um, and it's now dropped to 20. I think we found another that said like 12%. I, I personally feel that a lot of this is because we are no longer getting um, a good reading on how many people have COVID because everybody's doing home tests. And there is a vast majority of people with long COVID that don't realize they have long COVID, so they are not being diagnosed, and so we don't have that information readily available. What I went ahead and did, though, is looked on Tuesday at what the world data shows currently as a very large number, 600 million people. And if you look at the 20% of that, that's going to be 120 million people that have long COVID. And if you think of that on more of a economy scale, that's a significant amount of people that are now going to need um, help because the disability that some of these patients deal with is pretty significant. So those at risk, obviously, I've already mentioned those with severe illness, um, specifically those that have been in the hospital or have needed any sort of ICU care, uh, anyone with the underlying health conditions, those that haven't gotten the vaccine, unfortunately, have a higher risk. And then those with the multi-system inflammatory syndrome, um, that's a lot of the, the children that have gotten long COVID, um, they're going to have a higher risk as well. So this is just a pictorial view of the many symptoms that patients express. The larger the bubble, the more common that ailment has been um, described. There was a study that was done in 2001 on an international scale, and what they found is that fatigue, post-exertional malaise, and brain fog were the top three. Now, I will say that the, the research is coming out. There's That fluctuates a little bit. Fatigue is still the highest complaint among these patients. So what we've done is sort of pulled out the bigger, less frequently understood 
symptoms or syndromes that are going along with long COVID just so that we can kind of talk about uh, any questions that you guys might have from seeing this in the media. The first one is post-exertional malaise. Um, and this really is, it's, it's opposite of what you would think for people um, that are coming off of a major illness. So the definition of it is literally the crash after you've exerted yourself. And that exertion could be physical, it could be cognitive. Basically how I think of it is any stressor to the body is going to be exertion. And what happens is they're stressed and it causes symptoms that they've already had, maybe even some brand new ones to get way worse. It can happen immediately or it can happen up to 72 hours after. And when that happens, they have this sort of drop off where all of their symptoms have hit either extreme levels or their fatigue is so bad that they're not getting out of bed, they've become housebound. It's gonna take them days, weeks, or even months to recover. And it's really difficult to locate what the trigger is. And that's where Marie and I have found ways to help people figure that out. Symptoms, um, you know, I have a list there, but the ones that we see the most often are fatigue, exhaustion, the brain fog. So that has memory, um, you know, problem solving sometimes is involved there. Um, the exercise intolerance is extremely large and then shortness of breath. And we've had a lot of patients with neurological changes like uh, numbness, tingling, or even loss of movement. There's a lot of research that is going on right now to try to figure out what's causing this. And what we have found is um, a large part of the myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. This group really helped us figure out why these patients are so um, affected by this post-exertion malaise. So basically what's happening is they are using their energy differently. They're no longer able to be effective in its use or even in its creation. So they're using their energy twice as fast as you or I would, and they only have a finite amount of it. So once they've used that energy, they're done for the day or the week. <clears throat> so that complaint of fatigue is, it's not just a feeling of tired, it's literally an empty gas tank. Um, you know, they can't go get a coffee like I did this morning to, to wake up a little bit um, because their body has nothing left to give. Uh, and I did mention that exertion is the root cause of the, the increase in symptoms. And what I want to really emphasize here is that, um, and Marie is going to reiterate it later, is that these patients are unable to improve their quality of life with exercise. Their focus is going to be more on energy conservation because each exacerbation that they go through is going to increase the damage to their body and increase their disability. Dysautonomia, you may have also heard of this one. So we we know that SARS-CoV-2 affects the, the lungs. We know that it affects the heart, but it can also affect your nervous system, specifically the autonomic nervous system. And if you don't know what that is, that is the thing that is literally keeping you alive and keeping your body functions what they need to be so that you're comfortable. So your heart rate, your blood pressure, breathing, you know, digesting the lunch that I hope you all have had. Um, dealing with the temperature changes that we've all been experiencing lately. There's two types, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic, just think of fight or flight. Parasympathetic is that rest and digest, you know, after Thanksgiving dinner. Those usually work in tandem. They're going back and forth and doing their thing normally. You don't even pay attention to it. But after a virus like COVID, um, attacks, it can cause this dysautonomia where no longer are they able to work in tandem. So symptoms there are listed, but um, what we have found is that a lot of patients with long COVID are having things like um, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And that is just a form of dysautonomia. Um, it is not a cardiac condition which is really important to recognize, their cardiac function is usually just fine. Um, and a good example of what, just a small snippet of what these patients are dealing with, when you go from reaching for something on the floor and you stand up really fast and you get that head rush, they deal with that way more than just that one second. You know, it's something that lasts for a long period of time. And the research is showing that that's really because their nervous system is not controlling uh, their circulation. The thing that I want you to take away, you know, the symptoms are there, but the thing I want you to take away from this and post-exertion malaise is that both are 
things that you don't necessarily see somebody dealing with, you know, they are hidden and that's what we would call a hidden or a silent disability. And then the last little thing that I wanted to, to point out is vertigo. There might be a lot of you guys that have dealt with this. Um, they have found that between 7 and 12% of patients with COVID-19 do experience some sort of dizziness. And the reason behind this, they have found that there is a direct correlation with the inner ear and vestibular nerve, just like there was with the um, um, oh my gosh, olfactory nerve um, for sense of smell and taste. And that's being affected directly by the virus. It can also cause inflammation to all the little ear vessels um, that we have. And that's going to distort the way the little level in our, our ear tells our brain where we are. That's where a lot of that dizziness comes from. <laughs> all right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the tips and tricks. So now we know a little bit about long COVID. We know what kind of conditions it can cause. So what are some simple things that you can do at home about it? So first, the first thing we want to do is to best understand the fatigue or the exhaustion aspect of it. And one of the best ways that we do that as physical therapists and occupational therapists is through education. So here on our chart, we have energy and we're gonna compare it to money because most adults, we, we can definitely think about budget. We can think about how much things cost and how much we have coming in. Uh, when you talk about money, people tend to listen. So um, here we get, you know, every night you wake up refreshed. This is pre-illness. You get about a hundred bucks in your, in your bank account. And then your yellow is kind of the energy or the, the bank, the money that you've used for that day. So you can see, you know, you tend to use a little less energy than what you have taken in. So then our blue down here is kind of our leftover energy. You kind of add that onto your savings account. Um, and then you can see even on Sunday, the last bar, you're going to use about the same amount of energy as what's taken in. So that's probably that person that's training for a marathon. They do their long run on Sunday or something like that. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about what the bank account might look like once someone has post-exertional malaise. So you'll see that maybe on Monday, they wake up, they have that $100 in their bank account. But the tricky part is, is that everything that cost $1 now costs $2. So we're thinking about that inflation aspect, which I think a lot of us can relate to right now in our economy. Um, but the problem is, is when you spend more than what you have, you end up having a deficit. So that's where we see that red down there. So if you keep following this trend, you can see that after about 72 hours, you can have what's called a crash. So that's our Thursday, Friday, where nothing is happening. You're not taking in energy. You're not expending energy. Nothing's happening. And then you try to get back to square one and you start over. So basically what we want is to, to help, our, help people with long COVID to develop an energy bank account. So some people like Excel worksheets, and we've had patients come in with these beautiful worksheets. Usually they have a background of being an accountant or an engineer, but they're very numbers oriented, and it, it's, it's beautiful. It's wonderful what they're able to do. Or you can be old fashioned and you can use pen and paper and make a journal. Um, so we wanna think about our deposits, our bills, our investments, and our savings. So when we're thinking about our deposits, we're going to think about a paycheck, and it's going to be someone who works hourly, not salary. So our big paycheck is going to be from that nighttime sleep. We might be, you know, really practicing our sleep hygiene. We're planning to get eight hours of sleep. We get in bed, and in the morning, we realize we only got four, and we wake up pretty tired. So that means you have less energy for that day to start with. Other ways to get a deposit into our energy bank account is through nutrition. We got to use food to fuel our body as well as water and other ways to intake that. And then another thing we're really going to talk about today is putting in those rest breaks throughout the day. That's another way to get a deposit into your energy bank account. All right. Now, when we're thinking about bills, we're going to think about different kind of bills when it comes to energy. We're going to think about uh, cognitive bills. We're going to think about um, physical, social, and emotional so thinking about cognitive, that's going to be more about the brain power when you're thinking. So that can be being parenting, doing those tasks of parenting. That can be schoolwork. When you're thinking about physical, it can be something simple like brushing your teeth. 
because remember the the task is going to cost more now than it did prior to illness um or it could be that person that's training for that marathon that's going to be another physical bill emotional it can be watching the world news i mean who can get good sleep after that i don't know <laughs> or it could be something exciting like that family member got engaged and you're so pumped and excited for them you're still expelling some energy that way um, so then we, you know, and then there's going to be some tasks that take a little bit from both. So you think about driving a car, you're going to think about that physical and that cognitive component. And so it's going to kind of take a two part bill that way. All right. So thinking about investments and investments more when you spend a little now to have a nice long, long term outcome. So one patient that I talked to his way to get an investment was to sit on his porch, and this was January, February, but to sit on the porch and drink a hot cup of coffee, looking out over his land, that gave him such, such meaning and purpose to his everyday life. Now for him, where he was in his recovery, it was a lot of work to get out of bed. It was a lot of work to make that cup of coffee, to get bundled up for the cold weather, to sit out there, but for him, it really made a big difference in his day. So that's a great example of an investment. And then when we're thinking about our budget, we're not just planning for one day. We got to plan for the week. We got to plan for the month. You got to think about all those things that you need to save up for, put in your savings account and things where you know you're going to, you're going to, it's going to cost a little more. So it might be that vacation if you're driving to the beach and that drive there can take it out of you or knowing when you come home, you're going to need a day or two to recoup. Or if you have small children loading up the car to go to the beach. I can tell you from experience that takes a lot of energy. <laughs> All right. So now that we have an understanding of our energy bank account, how do we stay in budget? Well, of course, we use the four P's. Now, anyone who's been to occupational therapy school and maybe physical therapy, it, I mean, it is harped on to talk about four P's of energy conservation. So this is a second nature to us, um, but something we do with a lot of our patients. Um, we're going to think about planning, so planning ahead to avoid extra trips. So you're in the kitchen, you're going to, you know, you're making scrambled eggs and you're going to use eggs and milk. The idea is you open up the refrigerator, you get them both out, and then you close the refrigerator. So you're, you're not expending more energy to do that task. It might be going to the grocery store, you make that list, that written list before you go, so you don't have to retrace your steps a lot in the grocery store. It can also be asking for help. Recruit your family and friends to help you. It is human nature to want to be needed. So do something kind and ask someone for help. They will really appreciate that. And then another one is to schedule in rest breaks. So that's when you're planning for your day, for your week, for your month, to make sure you have those rest breaks planned in. And then you can use different kind of aids. So a common aid that I use in my house is to use my Alexa. I use Alexa to set a timer. I use Alexa to remind me of something to, to check on later or even to check the weather so I don't have to get my phone out and scroll through. I just yell at Alexa um, to ask. All right, the next one is to prioritization. Prioritization. So what needs to be done today? What can wait? What can be delegated to other people? And what can we just delete? I actually read an interesting Forbes article about how to be a sufficient business person, and it talked about the four Ds um, and basically had that concept in there. And honestly, I found it super helpful for myself as well as working with my patients. Uh, the next one is pace. So here we want to think about resting and resting often. We want to take breaks before uh, we need them or we feel tired. So again, we want to take breaks before we feel tired. That's a big component. We want to maintain a slow and steady pace with shorter durations, using more time. We're going to listen to our bodies and know our limits by avoiding, and we're going to uh, avoiding our set targets there. All right, and then the last one of the four Ps is thinking about positioning. So this might be your desk set up at work, um, and it might be, you know, how you can change your environment to be the most efficient for you. Um, and also just kind of thinking, um, sitting down actually takes about 25% less energy than staining for a task. So if you're doing some, some prep in the kitchen, you're going to make a stir fry and you're chopping all the veggies, sit down to do it and you're going to conserve energy that way. If you're doing your morning routine and you're 
uh, doing your makeup and your hair, you can sit down and conserve some energy that way as well. The end result typically looks like a set routine with breaks at very specific time and times when harder tasks can be performed. So when you have more energy, you can do those harder things. All right, so one of our big ways to get a deposit into our energy bank account is sleep. Sleep is so important. So sleep, um, a lack of sleep can actually lead to an increase in accidents. It can lead to an increase in mood changes. It can lead to more difficulty with attention and concentrating on a task. And it can decrease your immune response, making it more likely that you can get sick. So my big advice here is to try to get some more sleep. All right, so lack of sleep may promote inflammatory factors, release and impair human immunity, and both reduce and prolong sleep times have been associated with a higher risk of respiratory infection. Um, and these are some different studies that, that we've read through and kind of picked apart. Um, like I mentioned before, Courtney and I have done a few presentations in this area and have been working with this patient population for gosh, two years now. Ah. Uh, so um, there is a link between decreased sleep one week prior to the infection to the severity of the COVID infection. So even if you don't have long COVID, even if you're not sick now, you really want to have good sleep now. So it's definitely important to try to work on that now. Um, so if you're concerned about your sleep, so some good ways to kind of start that is to make a diary. Um, so there's different ways to do that. Uh, there's different smart watches where I have the Apple watch. It kind of gives you a very general like, oh, you were in bed for this amount of time. It'll give me a reminder 30 minutes before going to bed that it's going to be bedtime. Um, I have kind of a set timer to wake up every day of the week um, so I don't sleep in too long on the weekends and make it harder on Monday morning. Um, the Fitbit can be very specific. It will give you the different kinds of sleep that you had at different points in the night, how often you woke up. Um, and things like that. There's also different apps you can have on your phone. I tried out the Sleep Cycle app and it, I did the free version, I didn't buy it, um, but it will record your sleep. It, it turns your microphone on and it listens to you. Um, if you pay for it, you can hear all your snoring throughout the night, um, but it does give you, you know, how much REM sleep and, and things like that throughout the night. And then if you're old fashioned, you wanna use pen and paper, write some things out. Um, you can say what time you went to bed, when you think you fell asleep, how often you woke up, what time you woke up, what time you got out of bed, how you felt when you woke up, um, and just kind of give a general rating. So if you do this for about two weeks, it'll give you an idea of where your deficits are and where you're doing really well. All right, so how to use your computer well. Um, so this is something that can definitely cause a lot of fatigue. In today's world, we're on computers a lot more than we were before. Working in healthcare, writing our medical notes is a, a lot of time spent on computers. Um, also just doing research, going through research articles. We're doing virtual visits now. We do virtual presentations now. So we spend a lot of time on our computers. Um, so there's a few different ways that you can adjust it to make it a little easier and a less of a strain on you. I'm gonna try to take you through um, how you can do that. So I'm going to switch the sharing real quick. Um, and we are going to go to settings. Yep, got it. Okay. All right, so good. Um, so basically, you can go to... Let's see. Okay, so if you open settings, this is a Dell computer you can find where your ease of access is. Um, if you double click that, the, on the first one on displays, you can look at how you can make your text bigger, you can make it smaller um, to kind of fit what your needs are. I tend to make mine big. You can see make everything bigger. I have mine at 125% um, and that's what works best for me. Another thing you can do is change your mouse pointer um, you can see over on the left side of your screen, it has the different components. Um, you can make your mouse size a lot bigger on there. You can, you can change the color of it, making it black, making it white, uh, just to make it a little easier for you to follow. 
And then if we go to color filters down on your left side, you can turn on a filter and it's going to invert your screen. Um, I will warn you that on WebEx or any video chat, it kind of distorts a view and people look interesting. Um, but if you're if the white light off of it is a lot, then you can invert it so that the screen is black and then the writings in white. All right, so going back to our presentation. Okay. All right, so we already took our tour. All right, so those are the different things that we went over. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is the 2020 rule. And before um, Evan had mentioned this in one of the presentations, and I was super happy to hear of an orthopedic PT to talk about the 2020 rule. Um, so the premise of the 2020, 2020 rule is to give your eyes a break from the screen. There was a research study done to determine that 20 minutes is how often we need a break that it reduces your eye strain, and they found that you need to focus about 20 feet away to relax your eyes and to give your eyes about 20 seconds to really let them relax. If you're stuck in a cubicle, you can also close your eyes, um, and then you can kind of go back to your task. So the reason that computer screens can cause dry eye, they can cause eye strain and fatigue, is for some reason when we stare at screens, we reduce how often we blink, and that blinking actually lubricates your eyes, and so you're decreasing how lubricated your eyes are. In the younger population, we tend to not notice this as much, and we tend to notice it a little bit later on in our adulthood. <clears throat> so basically, how are we going to make this a habit? we got to build it into our ritual, our routine, our daily habits. So, you know, make a timer on your phone. Use Alexa to remind you every 20 minutes and try to do that until it's a habit for you. All right, so now that you are dealing with your energy conservation and things are getting better, um, it's time to start focusing on returning to exercise. And we go by, as I just realized I still have my mask on, uh, the rule of tens. So best way is just to use an example. So if you're walking, you go out to figure out what your baseline is. If you can walk for 10 minutes, fabulous, before you get tired. Go back home, next day you do 10 minutes again. You do that for 10 days. And then after that 10th day, you're gonna increase it by 10%. So that would be one to two minutes. And then you do that every 10 days, you just keep increasing it. We like to use the Borg scale because it gives a nice little view of where you should be really pushing yourself. And that's that beautiful little rainbow scale there to the right of your screen. Uh, we go by the four to six, which is the moderate activity. Um, and essentially, if you can still have a short conversation, but you are breathing heavily, um, or if you just feel like, you know, I'm comfortable, but I'm, I'm really working hard. Um, that's about where you need to be. And then, of course, you're going to add in some, some strength training because that's going to help with bone density, um, balance, and everything else. The big caveat here is if you have been diagnosed with post-exertional malaise or autonomic dysfunction of any kind, then you want to make sure that you're working with a medical professional with knowledge of those conditions so that they can guide the increase in activity. All right, so when to reach out to occupational therapy, and the next slide will be about physical therapy. Um, but for occupational therapy, it's when you're having trouble with your ADLs or IDLs. ADLs are activities of daily living. So thinking about your basic self-care. So that is, you know, feeding yourself, uh, grooming, brushing your teeth, putting your clothes on, showering, um, sexual activity, and sleep. And then our IADLs are instrumental activities of daily living. So those are things outside of your basic self-care task, and that's going to be, you know, cooking, cleaning, work-related tasks, parenting, um, you know, exercising or uh, planning a meal, um, all those other activities you do. So what we mean by occupation and occupational therapy is how you occupy your time. So it's things that you want, need, and are expected to do. So I have a few different random things on there that might be kind of things that you do throughout the day. 
And what an occupational therapist traditionally does is they help the person either modify their environment, adapt the way they do certain tasks, or even use assistive devices or different equipment to help get through their day right now and to make them more successful in their daily activities. <laughs> All right, and then physical therapy. So, you know, we do a lot of preventative care, rehabilitation, treating some more of those chronic, chronic conditions, um, especially in my case with the neurological, like stroke, spinal cord injury, that kind of thing. Um, but in regards to long COVID, one thing that we really help with is helping to diagnose that post-exertional malaise and any other autonomic dysfunctions. We don't give the diagnosis. That is something that there are specific um, medical uh, tests for, but we do help provide the information that um, the doctor might need. If there are issues related to dizziness, um, I do suggest that you reach out to somebody um, within, you know, your primary care doctor, or even if you're seeing um, the long COVID clinic, reaching out so that you can see a vestibularly, vestibularly trained physical therapist. All right, and I think um, Courtney reached on it or touched base on this a minute ago. It's really important to find a therapist who um, who feels comfortable with treating long COVID. Um, so just like a, a medical doctor, you'll have some who specialize in neurology, some who specializes in orthopedic. Um, it's same for your OTs and your PTs. We have our specialization. So you want to make sure that you're seeing someone who specializes in this diagnosis. Um, all right. Okay, yeah, all right, so here are our main takeaway points that Courtney and I want you to take home. So first of all, we want you to remember that, you know, it's about one in five people who have survived COVID are also suffering from long COVID. And there are so many different possible symptoms out there. So people may have one or they may have 10 different symptoms, but it's a personal experience and not something that you would necessarily know on the outside looking in. Long COVID for many is an invisible disability, and by disability, we don't mean that it is permanent, um, but it, there are times where people do completely recover. Um, but in that moment where they are today, it is considered a disability, um, and it is an invisible disability where they may show up for work and they do really well in the morning, and then they are crashing in the afternoon and unable to complete some of those tasks. Um, it might be that post-exertional malaise and that exhausting aspect of having long COVID, or it might be someone who's having, who's normally really on top of it, and they're just really struggling with multitasking as well. Um, <clears throat> so even though it's not something you can see, it is definitely something that is real. So the best way to help someone who is experiencing long COVID is really to be a listener and to listen to their experience and to validate what they're going through and to offer any support you could, could do as well. And if you are someone who is dealing with long COVID, remember that your body is talking to you. Respect that your body has fought off this viral infection and, and is continuing on that fight. So you need to slow down and listen to your body. Your body talks and it might be in the form of pain. It might be soreness in your muscles. It might be headaches. It might be eye strain or just overall fatigue. But this is your way your body communicates with you. Um, so try to slow down and listen. So this is our COVID recovery clinic. Um, just to give you a little information here at UNC, we specialize with the adult population. Um, so most of our clients are 18 years of age or up, have a documented COVID positive test. Um, I will say in early 2020, when the tests weren't readily available, um, there have been a few, few of our clients who technically weren't tested and have that positive test. Um, and then if, they're have, if you or you're, someone else is having lingering symptoms that last for more than one month, um, to go to the clinic, you have to have a physician referral, um, and that can be provided by your primary care uh, provider or someone, a specialist as well. Um, the fax number is on here, as well as a phone number to reach out. All right. Do we have any questions? Okay. Got five minutes. <laughs> I 
Hi, Tom. I know Marie and Courtney pretty well. Um, sorry, I joined late. Question for oh. you. you. You have lots of. Can you hear? Hey, Carla. <laughs> um, you have lots of great ideas about how to manage. Primarily physical fatigue. How? What does the literature say, or or what do you know about how to manage mentee? Are there are things that the techniques that you recommend or strategies you recommend that apply equally well to cognitive exertion and fatigue? Yeah, so, you know, we only it was 45 minutes and we were told to save time for questions. So we were really trying to hone down on a few things. Um, so uh, we went over a little bit of how to modify the computer um, and the 2020 um, 2020 rules to uh, try to decrease some of that um, that aspect of it. Um, a lot of times our, our patients who are having other aspects of cognitive fatigue and brain fog, they'll reach out and um, see some of our speech pathologists um, or our neuropsychologists like you, Carla, um, and that aspect as well. Thanks. Oh, okay. So there was a question about um, can long COVID also feel like a panic attack? Um, I think that's something that, you know, there's a there's a lot of reasons for panic attacks. Um, I have had patients that say that they feel like when they are having that exacerbation, they feel like it's a panic attack. Um, so I guess technically it could feel like that. I do think that if you feel that you are having panic attacks, that it is important to reach out to a medical professional mm -hmm. um, just in case there is some underlying issue that they can help with. And vaccinated. Um, yeah. So the other question is, can people who are vaccinated and boosted get long COVID? Um, I believe it, that's a fabulous question, and I think Dr. Barada would probably be the best person to answer that question, and we are happy to, to reach out to him and find out and then um, post it somewhere. Um, but I believe, yes, it's possible, but the, the risk is so low because of the fact that you have that vaccination um, that it's not really on the scale, so to speak. No, you summed it up. Were there any other questions? Where will this be posted? I believe it's on the YouTube mm -hmm. channel, correct? Yes. Yeah, so the, the first one that Courtney posted in the chat, the Therapy Thursday, is a YouTube channel. Um, so that would be a, a way that you could see the past ones, too, that have been done for Therapy Thursday. Light pain specifically. So, um, Brian, I'm curious as to, do you mean joint pain in relation to long COVID or just joint pain in general? Um, so within the long COVID piece, so the question is, what can you do about joint pain when you have long COVID? So I think uh, there's a couple answers to that one. One, I think there's um, a piece that the medical side can approach it as. Um, I know that our doctors within our clinic have provided some um, specific types of medications, and I don't want to give out what those particular ones are, but the other things that we do with people, you know, doing light stretching. So if somebody's dealing with post-exertional lays, it's a little bit different uh, because we don't want to stress out their system too much. But if they are having joint pain, um, sometimes just doing the normal PT type of things, stretching, um, strength, yeah, full, so strength. full strength, no muscle ten tightness or tenderness. Yeah. So that's one that um, reaching out to the medical staff might be helpful because they we have had a lot of patients that have inflammation within their joints. That's very, it's slight, um, but it's enough to, to aggravate. Um, I've also had a lot of um, improvement in having patients go through um, aquatic therapy because that helps them to um, mobilize that joint a lot easier. 
Well, and I think figuring out too, like, why are they having joint pain? Is it because they're trying to do some of those daily activities they were doing before? Mm -hmm. And you're thinking about that energy budget and it's costing them just twice as much and then they're having a crash and that's how their body's communicating that they've overdone it. Um, so I, I would really look in task analysis and probably journaling kind of what they're doing and seeing why they're having an increase in joint pain with the long COVID component. Um, and I would be curious, is that one joint or is that more? It could, yeah, it could, be. It could 100% be an energy crash. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I think we're technically out of time now. Um, all right, well, thank you so much for joining. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Musical chairs, you guys challenged us in a different way. <laughs> we missed having Evan. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.